You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 28. This week on the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, we're talking the how, when, and why of goose flagging, and we're going to continue our duck profile and feature the king eider. All right, welcome to this, the 28th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. You can find us at hpoutdoors.com or on iTunes where you can catch all of the episodes that we've put out as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you'd like to give us a shout and uh, ask us a question or make us a comment that we may play on the air, you can call us at our HP Outdoors waterfowl hotline at 724-609-FOWL, 724-609-3695. And if you hadn't had the opportunity to do so, you can sign up for the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast newsletter uh, via our website as well. So lots of different ways to keep up with us here at HP Outdoors. And joining me on the show today, as he always does, is the other half of HP Outdoors, Dan Harushka. Dan, how are you, bub? Doing pretty well, my friend. Um, We're into March now, and... I know, I know, I always talk about the weather, but, you know, we're finally into the 10-day forecast where there's no negative temperatures, and and pretty soon there's no temperatures in the teens, so that's good because I know there's a lot of sickness going around, and I know my, my girls have a cold, and the wife is not feeling too hot, so, you know, it'll be nice to get rid of this and get out of this time, and actually Sunday, well, this will be out Monday, and we spring ahead this uh this Sunday is daylight savings time, so that's exciting. Yeah, it means uh when I think about spring ahead, I think about turkey season coming up and um you know the <laughs> we got almost nine inches of snow here last night, so it certainly doesn't feel like spring right this second. But as you mentioned, our extended forecast here looks pretty good. We're into the fifties and out into the sixties, so it looks like spring is gonna come here pretty quickly and I'm getting ready to uh get out there and chase some long beards but uh you know we got a we got a good show lined up this week we're gonna profile the king eider you know kind of tag along with the sea duck episode that we had last week and uh talk a little bit more about another sea duck species and then we're gonna get into a little bit of uh goose flagging which i think is something that you know a lot of guys see being used in the field maybe on a video or something like that but you know, I, I get a, I get the sense that it's something that a lot of guys maybe don't understand exactly how it plays into, you know, being used in the field or when you should use it or why it's effective and those sort of things. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about goose flagging and uh, maybe clearing up some questions that guys might have on that. But before we get into some of that stuff, I was doing some browsing this week and looking for, you know, just some things that we could talk about on the show. And I came across some pretty interesting things that I thought we could want to, we might want to share. And, you know, the first thing that I came across was, um, you know, we all remember the, the miracle on the Hudson when the, you know, the airplane was brought down by hitting, you know, flock of Canada geese in 2009. And this little blurb that I was reading about was talking about just how much, uh, damage, you know, waterfowl and birds do, you know, as far as, you know, reported by the Federal Aviation Administration. And uh, a report that they came out with said that airplanes have struck more than 138,000 birds between 1990 and 2013, and they've cost nearly $217 million in damage since 1990. So it's pretty crazy to think about how many birds you know, are actually getting hit by water or how, how many waterfowl birds that are getting hit by airplanes. We don't really realize, um, you know, they named birds that were being hit as, uh, including, um, widgeon, harlequin, golden eye, mallards, which were the most common. Um, basically mallards had been struck by 749 planes since 1990 and, uh, causing $16.3 million in damage. So, um, pretty 
pretty crazy to think about that. And bird strikes combined cause uh, the aircraft industry um, $187 million in damage each year. So uh, I bet you didn't. I bet you didn't think that it was that common that you're up there whacking ducks and geese with airplanes. So you think that while these guys are flying planes, they're able to ID a duck that they hit at, you know, either landing or taking off? Be like, oh, that was a mallard. Chalk that one up. Uh, Well, I'm sure when they land, they clean out the the turbo turbines or whatever. They could check the speculum. (laughs) See what what kind of bird they I was going to say, do you think they actually, I I would imagine that they would just fry up in there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how they track it, but this report indicated that they were able to identify species, at least to some degree. And, you know, my brother-in-law is a a pilot, um, and he's, he's told me that he's seen flocks of geese at just ridiculously high altitudes and stuff. So, I mean, I, you know, I think we, I don't, I don't, I know that I never even thought about that much, but I guess it's a lot more common than, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, what maybe I thought. But, you know, another thing I noticed, Dan, when I was doing some research and, and this story really caught my eye because I know this is something similar to, to what's impacted an area w- near you with the deer population, but um, they're talking about problems in California with uh, due to drought conditions and uh, the limited amount of water that's around, it's really causing, you know, the ducks and geese to kind of congregate on the small available water sources that are, um, you know, available. And, uh, you know, specifically talk, they're talking about the area um, in the, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's the Tool Lake um, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And they'd already collected over 10,000 ducks and geese that had been killed um as victims to uh, avian botulism and they're chalking it up to basically uh, an outbreak caused by all of these ducks and geese congregating and concentrating on small water, you know, water sources. And um, you know, they've had things like this happen in the past where um, I think they had similar thing happen in 2012 in this area where another 10,000 birds were roughly killed. But you know, this story struck me because I know you had a big, um, similar situation happened near you with the deer population, right? Like last year, yeah, year before, like the, maybe? the EHD was dropping deer all over the place. I know Pima tuning just had tons of dead deer right around the water edges, but yeah, when you're, I mean, and even, you know, lately we're putting up pictures of, of birds that, uh, you know, are on ice and congregating in holes, but most of those times they're on lakes. But I can imagine in California, you know, you get a couple of little watering holes and the amount of, you know, fecal matter that goes into that and you just start getting sick I, I imagine it doesn't take long to to spread especially when that's the only water to drink and they're trying to stay alive yeah i mean they're talking about how this refuge holds tens of thousands of wintering um or uh, migrating waterfowl during the peak of the season and that this particular refuge is the only uh one in the entire basin that has any water at all so i mean you can just imagine what you know the conditions are like and you know how they're contaminating their own water sources and things so pretty significant issue i think there and another thing that caught my eye kind of along the same lines was a bird um that was discovered in oregon tested positive for uh the bird flu uh, the avian flu strand uh h5n8 which you know is not uh any kind of threat to humans but you know it does kind of go back to the whole you know, thing of just, you know, reminding, make sure you're wearing gloves when you're cleaning birds and, you know, cleaning up the areas good with bleach and uh, washing your hands well and cooking your birds to, you know, minimum uh, 165 degrees, things like that, just to be sure that you're taking care of any kind of, uh, you know, um, disease or bacteria or whatever that could be, you know, in these birds, because you just never know. So, a routine, I think it was a mallard, if I remember correctly, something like that. Um, Yeah, yeah, routine mallard that was just being screened with positive for bird flu. So uh, be careful when you're out there, you know, doing that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So that says the the virus poses no human threat. I wonder if that is after the meat is cooked. Is it no threat to eat or, you know, it, it does warn you to, you know, wear gloves and wash your hands. So I'm guessing that it might not be too good for you anyways. 
Well, I mean, I don't think you want to expose yourself to anything that you don't need to unnecessarily. But I think the point is, um, although that strand may not be immediately harmful to humans, there could be a strand in a bird that could be. So, you know, you want to take those precautions regardless. A um, couple other things. We talked about, you know, when we do our duck profile segments, various, you know, areas of the country where they migrate to and stuff like that. And um, read a little bit about the uh, state of Louisiana and some of the public hunting opportunities that they have down there. And uh, there's one such area, well, two actually, that we're going to touch on. One, how's this one? I, I, how's it pronounced, Dan? Atchafalaya. Sure. I believe. Atchafalaya Delta, WMA. Um, this place is 3,250 acres of limited access land and 137,695 acres in total. Um, that is just a fantastic amount of public ground where you can chase game and to add on top of that there's another one down there that i can't pronounce you want to take a shot at that one too dan uh not really mar mar pass marpus something like that marpus swamp wma uh they just recently purchased an additional 1582 acres uh, to bring the total size of the WMA to 122,098 acres, all of which, um, you know, was open for public access and, uh, you know, is a place where you can hunt ducks and geese. So um, just, you know, that's just fantastic uh, opportunities for guys. And, you know, I live in an area where public ground is just so hard to come by and it's not close. It's not convenient. It's super crowded. Uh, so I love seeing places that have abundant, public access and just opportunities for guys to get out and chase the uh, chase birds. So all really good. So this stuff. is what this always crosses my mind. You see, you know, tons of guys with great hunts in Louisiana and it actually, I mean, every time I see it, I think about it, but especially after we just talked with uh, Jeff Coates from pit boss, when his dog was out in the water and they had a, was a bull shark swim by or tiger, some kind of shark. But I mean, that has to freak you out, but all these guys in Louisiana and these swamps, where they film like swamp, whatever, what is that show? Swamp people where they're killing all these gators. Like how, how worried do you have to be setting up in the morning? Like, are, are you, are they looking at that or is it, I don't know. I think I'd be freaked out a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I mean, I'm sure they manage. You don't really read or hear too much about duck hunters getting mauled by, gators or whatever but um i gotta imagine if you're hunting in an area where you know that they're at you're probably a little more nervous and you know had you known they were not there but i don't know but there's lots of opportunity down there that's for sure by judging by what we're seeing here and um you know there's something else i came across dan and i wanted to get your opinion on this and uh it's called the ultimate waterfowlers challenge and what this is is for $99 for a regular membership or a gold membership of $375, you basically get the opportunity to take shots of the harvested drake birds that you that you kill, send them into this organization, and they track this for you. And uh, basically, they track 41 separate species. And when you kill 15 of the 41 and you've sent them in, via picture and all that kind of proof you then become you get the award of a master waterfowl hunter and they send you a plaque or something of that effect then when you've killed 30 of 41 you become a master elite waterfowl hunter and then when you've killed all 41 you become a grand master waterfowl hunter Uh, each time you submit a species it's a five dollar transaction fee and uh 10% 10% of the proceeds go to Fallen Outdoors, which is a military um, organization that helps, you know, current uh, active duty and veteran military members, you know, helps them with hunts and gets them access to uh, the outdoors via, you know, public ground or different hunts and that kind of stuff. So, you know, at least 10% of the money is going to a good, a good cause. But I was interested to hear what you thought of something like this. And uh, how you felt about the opportunity be- to become a grand master waterfowl hunter? I don't know how I feel about it. 
because I think I think there's a lot of a lot of challenges out there that are are pretty cool, but I don't know. Sometimes I think it it gets in the way in the the meaning of you know why we do it. I think you know I think a lot of guys do it just to to boast and get a big head, but at the same time, I think it's pretty cool, and especially if they're if they're putting money towards uh, you know some wounded heroes and whatnot i think you know that's a great cause but i don't know i don't know if that's something i would do or not i had a good year um, i think i had a good year this year and i think i killed nine nine different species of ducks so yeah uh Um, i don't think i'd ever achieve the great what is grand master something grand master waterfowl hunter yeah yeah i don't think that would ever Um, happen for me yeah i i I think it's an interesting concept. Um, so I would compare it to, um, you know, like turkey hunting is, is all, is the first thing that comes to my mind. You know, the, the grand slam or whatever it is shooting all the various subspecies of the turkey. Right. Um, you know, that kind of thing. I get why you would want to do it. And, you know, shooting all like the 26 North American big game or whatever it is. Like I get why that's a, a a pursuit that someone would want to take on. I don't get why you have to pay somebody to call you a grandmaster waterfowl hunter to, to do it. Um, I mean, everybody listening to this show probably knows, you know, a fantastic waterfowl hunter that's probably never seen, a king eider like we're going to talk about today in the wild that doesn't make them that doesn't mean that they're not a great hunter you know what i mean um so i, I do like the fact that the money is you know dedicated goes part of it goes to a good organization and that kind of stuff but to me this feels just a little bit more of one of the sensationalized the you know of the sport and in in one step further away from the traditional aspect of it but um I mean, it's done. It's done really well. They put a lot of resources into it. They've uh, teamed up with Wildfowl Mag- Magazine and some other um, organizations. So, I mean, you know, I think for some guys, it's probably a pretty cool thing. Um, but you know, for me personally, I don't. I don't think it's something that yeah. that I would pursue. But I thought it was interesting, and I was interested to hear your take on it. And I'd like to hear, uh, you know, you guys listening to this show, what you think of it, and. Um, you can send us an email at info out info at HPL's doors. Jeez. Oh man. Info at HPOutdoors.com. Or, uh, if you're not in our Facebook group yet, you can come on over to the HP outdoors, waterfowl, uh, podcast listeners group on Facebook and, uh, talk with us there about it. And I'd just like to hear what you guys, uh, what you guys think and what you have to say about it. So I think it depends a lot. I think it depends on, um, my day, on the social media too, because, you know, we've talked to the last couple of guests about social media and good and bad about it. You know, people starting Facebook pages, hating on other people. And it's just, it's, I don't know. It's that it's easy for the anti hunters to get a hold of. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it sort of does gla- glamorize and that kind of stuff, the actual killing of the bird and the collecting of it and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I for me, I just don't like titles, you know, like, um, I don't like, you know, people saying they're a better hunter than this person or whatever. I mean, I, I would, ha- I would, you know, I look at it like if I had the opportunity to hunt with someone that's harvested 41 out of 41 species, I'm not going to call them a grandmaster waterfowler. I want to just, I want to hear the stories. I want to hear the places you've been, the experiences that you went through to, to accomplish that just, but, but I would have just as good of a time talking to, you know, a 13 year old kid who just killed his first wood duck and hearing him tell that story, you know, so that, that would equally be, be as gratifying. So, you know, it's not about the title and it's not about the fact that, you know, you're trying to, you know, show that you're better than somebody else. It's just the fact that whether you're talking to someone who's harvested 41 out of 41 species or one of 41 species, everybody in that conversation knows how it feels to harvest a duck and why we're out there doing it. You know what I mean? So that, that's what it's more, that's what it's about for me. And it's not so much about, you know, racking up the trophies and putting plaques on the wall, but to each their own. And, um, if you've done, if you've done the 41 out of 41 and you're listening to the show, please send us an email and, and tell us some stories. Cause I, I'm sure 
that you've been through a heck of an experience and no doubt traveled throughout North America to, to fill those, those 41 tags. So we'd love to hear from you for sure. Speaking of filling the tags, one of the, the hardest ones has got to be uh, for some guys, you know, I would think is some of the sea ducks and, you know, this week we're talking King Eider, which I've never seen in the wild uh, myself personally. Um, so this is a good one for us this week to uh, kind of learn and share with the listeners of this show. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get into that and uh, do this week's duck profile. All right, the king eider. The male is about twenty three inches, and the female is twenty one. So a good sized duck, about three. They're about three and a half pounds. The male king eider. They have a black lower back. Rump, scapulars, tail, breast, belly, and sides. The tail is a brownish black and the bill is an orange. And it sweeps upward into an orange frontal shield outlined in black with a pale blue crest. And it's kind of, I don't know, I'm I'm divisive on whether it's a good looking bird or not. It's definitely unique. And the neck and chest and foreback are a cream white and they have a white patch at the base of the tail and in the forepart of the upper wings and the legs and feet are dull yellow to orange and the female king eiders they're brown to a dusky brown v marks that can be similar in color to common eiders and the bill and facial skin are dark olive gray and the legs and feet are grayish so definitely the females they just aren't as sharp looking as the males. Come to breeding. The king eider has a circumpolar distribution. The North Amer- in North America, it breeds along the Arctic coast from Alaska to Greenland and along most of the northern Hudson Bay shoreline. And king eiders generally nest in vegetation, often adjacent to small lakes and ponds or small islets on the coast. And they lay not a very large amount, usually four to five eggs. When was the last time you said circumpolar distribution? Um, that might be the second time in my life. <laughs> That's two more times than I've ever said it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know the first time I said it. Well, let me tell you, the uh, the majority of the Western population of the King Eider uh, winters in the, uh, at sea along the Atlanta, uh, Alaska Peninsula and uh, with rare sightings off of British Columbia and California, while the eastern population winters off of the coast of southern Greenland and occasionally will come all the way down as far south as Florida. Uh, Recent migration counts, kind of, you know, from the mid-90s, basically provided an estimate of 375,000 birds. Uh, There have been occasional dramatic, you know, sort of population fluctuations, uh, that basically have been a result more or less of late ice breakup or severe weather conditions or starvation periods. So um, due to the remoteness of where their range is, uh, you know, not a whole lot is known about their current population based on the information that we obtained. Um, but a lot of, a lot of counts believe that uh, there's been a decline, you know, kind of in the King Eider population since the mid seventies. Um, they're known for diving to great depths to feed on mollusks, crustaceans, and various aquatic insects. And interesting fact of note, there is a record of one King Eider feeding at the bottom of 30 fathoms, which is uh, equivalent to 180 feet of water in the Bering Sea. So pretty impressive diving abilities. And obviously they better learn to do that if they're going to be uh, living in those areas and those kind of depths of water. So, uh, there you have it, this week's profile of the King Eider. So, Dan, if I was doing the, uh, you know, the 41 species thing, I can tell you that uh, there would be, you know, a handful of ducks. It would probably just be really hard for me to fill and uh, not be able to get. So, King Eider is probably one of them, if I'm being, being truthful to you. Oh, well, if you go down with the, you know, Mr. Coates, the pit boss, I, I think that would uh, come pretty easy. He he usually lines them up, I believe. Really? The King Eiders? Yeah. Hmm. I think so, doesn't he? I, I thought that, uh, you know, the that area they're shooting, you know, Sir Scoter and uh, Old Squall I mean, and stuff like that. Scoters. I don't know. I don't know how many King Eiders they get over there, but you might be right. 
here's my question. Here's my question. How or who recorded this King Eider feeding at 180 feet of water in a Bering Sea? Where does that come from? Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Was there just someone randomly in a Bering Sea at 30 fathoms? Well, I can't imagine it was random by any stretch. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that there were scientists or someone, biologists, doing research on them, and maybe they had some tagged remotely that they could track. I don't know. I watch, uh, uh, like, Shark Week, and they tag great whites that swim all over the place and track them to various depths. Maybe they're doing the same things with, uh, with ducks. Mm. Who knows? But... Just questioning everything today. I don't know why. It's one of those days. Fantastic. Well, let's <laughs> uh, let's let's question um, the use of goose flags and their their viability in the field. And you know, I think that as I mentioned, I think the goose flag is something that people know about, but I'm just not sure how much, particularly newer waterfowlers. I would guess. Um, you know, I think I think for some guys, it's probably just feels counterintuitive to be out there waving around, making a bunch of motion when everything you read about talks about concealment and cover and, and that kind of stuff. So let's, uh, let's, let's get into that topic a little bit and, uh, sort of, you know, uncover some of the mystery that's, uh, surrounding goose flagging. So you've heard me make fun of Dan who knows how many times in this show, how he asks every single person and their brother about what's more important, the call or the motion and the spread. Well, this week's episode is going to be dedicated to Dan's love of the question and the fact that motion is very, very important <laughs> uh, in your spread. And one of the best ways to get motion into your spread when you're in a goose field um, is to use a goose flag. And it's got a lot of different applications and times and strategies to use it. So we're going to go ahead and, and get into that a little bit. But Dan, what do you what do you think about goose flagging and how much do you use it and uh you know how how effective do you feel that it is? Um I feel like we don't use it enough. And I think I really do believe that uh I mean, I think well, I, I have asked just about every person on the show about flagging. I think there was only one maybe that said it was, you know, kind of in our own heads that we need it. So I'll go with the majority and say that, you know, it is something that is definitely just a huge part of hunting and and a huge part of being successful. So... Um, you know, I think we definitely under, underuse it. And after researching more and the more that we, you know, we talk to these people on the show, I think, uh, I think we're going to have at least two flags running, you know, in this, in this coming season. You know, I'm going to go back to an episode that we had with Sean Stahl earlier in the year. And when we talked to him about various hunting strategies and things, and he said, do what you have to do to get the birds to do what you want them to do. And he talked about goose flagging and that being a tool. Um, just one of the things that you can use to get them to do what you want them to do. And um, I think that that, as a, as a generic answer as that is, or quote as that is, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, is goose is goose flagging the number one thing or the only thing that you can do to kill kill birds no uh are you going to kill birds if you don't flag yeah it, it's it's just one of those tools that in any given situation could be the difference maker to get a bird you know to get a flock to turn or a flock to finish so i think going through some of the different circumstances and situations when you might use that um would be beneficial and i think to start it off um you know, one of the biggest things that you hear from people, I think, is talking about flagging versus calling, like you mentioned. And depending on the conditions, you might it might almost be pointless to pick up the call. You know, the first thing we want to do is when we see birds on the horizon, everyone cover up, you know, call, 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 see what happens, whatever. 
they can see you a lot further off than they can hear you, especially if they're flying into the wind and they're up high or whatever, you know, they got all that noise that they're dealing with there. So you can use that as an, as a visual call versus an audio call, um, you know, with the call from your mouth to attract birds from a long ways off. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that, just because they you can see them doesn't mean that they got great great eyes on you yet. So if you make some movement and you know give them a reason to look your way, even from afar you can start pulling them in, you know, to your setup. Uh, what do you think there, Bub? Yeah, I think it was it was it Sean too talking about when calling into the wind, where if if birds are downwind, they can hear you from a lot further, obviously, but you know, calling and that would be a, a time to do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, the more, the more that I read about this getting, you know, preparing for the show and there's a lot of people that stay out of their blinds longer than what I would always feel comfortable doing. So, you know, making, making some commotion, what do you well, might not what be do you too mean bad. by that staying out of the blind what do you mean staying out of the blind like actually you know standing up like well i'm obviously talking about uh you know layout blinds cuz that's how we hunt but you know they're talking about actually being outside your blind you know when you see birds coming in and and making enough motion still holding a flag or without a flag but just you know actually running around in your spread well, so you said what the people would stay out longer than what you would be comfortable with. What what are you talking? I mean, how close are we talking? Well, I don't know. I mean, usually, well, the thing is where we hunt, usually, you know, you can't see them coming. You can, you can see them far off, but a lot of the times that we hunt, you know, we're in fields that have trees around them. So, you know, they get on you pretty quick, but. Yeah, I don't. I couldn't even give you a, a yardage. Maybe you know if they're within three hundred yards, and you know I would be in my blind if they're within five hundred yards. That's probably when I'd be heading back to my blind at the latest. Yeah, I, I think that you can stay out, like sitting in the blind. I mean, I don't think five. I think five hundred yards is still pretty far off for that. Um. I think that I think I think if it's done right, you can flag geese really close. All I mean, almost all the way in. Um, yeah, you can't be sitting up in your blind and they're flying over top of you, but you can work the flag in some different ways. And we're going to talk about some of this stuff. Um, so, but to your po- original point, like if birds are that far off initially you might need to stand up or you might need to, you know, make some more movement. I mean, you're trying to get their attention. And the way I look at this is they're so far off. If, if they're able to to figure out that you're a hunter at that far, then more power to them. But I mean, you're probably not going to get those birds to give you a look if they don't, if you don't give them something to catch their eye. So you can lay there and just watch them fly by at a distance, or you can give it a shot and see if you can turn them. So I, I think that the, you know, a flag is, is one of the only options that you really have if you want to give that a shot. Um, yeah, that's what, well, what I was saying is people are actually getting out of their blinds and running through their spread. Yeah. I, I mean, we've had, we've had guys and uh, maybe it was Sean again, talking about this, having flags on the pole on a, on a pole that's like higher up in the spread. Um, you see that with snow geese and stuff like that. I mean, I don't think it's crazy to to think like that when they're at a further enough distance. Um, now, if they're 100 yards off, the you shouldn't be running around in the decoys. But um, the point of it is, if they're far off, you got to make some noise. You can't just lay in your blind, beat the flag two or three times, you know, and say, eh, this is the flagging doesn't work, you know, and they're like two miles off or something crazy like that. You got to put a little effort into it when they're that far off. Um, but to my point... I think that subtle flagging can be used to finesse, um, you know, and finish birds. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're tucked in your blind and you've got birds circling, um, 
you know, I think you can use less ground, uh, you know, not where you're sitting up and like beating it into the air, but where the flag is kind of laying on the ground beside your blind and you reach out through the flag hole and you just flap it a couple times uh, as birds are on the corners looking at your spread that that Im- imitates birds stretching and beating their wings on the ground. I mean, that's a very natural calming type uh, sight for birds in flight to see. And that gives them something, you know, to kind of focus in on when they're when they're evaluating the spread and they're trying to pick out blinds and that kind of stuff. So uh, don't be afraid to use it when they're close. Just tone it down and don't you know, go overboard with it, I guess is my point when they're, when they're close, when they're working and you're trying to finish them, I'm not talking about when they're a quarter mile out and you're trying to just get their attention and turn them in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And definitely, I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is give up, you know, your hiding spot. So, I mean, you don't want to be, if they're close and making turns, you don't want to be sitting up out of your blind but like you said if you reach your arm out and you can finesse it a little bit yeah that's that's going to help you another thing that that i think can be used is um you know when you have birds coming into the they're they're coming into the hole um you know a lot of a lot of times guys want to be very quiet on the calls and you know oh they're finishing they're working just let them come let them come um and even this september we we proved that theory to be a little bit wrong. Um, you know, we would have a, a flock of 12 or 15 coming and right, you know, just before their feet would hit the ground, you know, we would start giving some really aggressive clucks on the calls and they would actually lift up and scoot up into the hole about 10 yards further than what they had originally planned on, uh, you know, landing and putting, you know, putting them in better gun range. To the same effect, I think a flag can be used to some degree when birds are coming in. If they're if they're coming in to finish and they're not lining up right with your hole, or they're going to finish kind of off to the side, or you know where you don't quite want them, just a little bit of beat, a little bit of motion, not a ton, you know, not not a an exaggerated amount, but just enough to sort of let them know, like, hey, there's there's life over here. This is something you you need to focus on, and they they, they might turn and square up into your finishing area a little bit better. So. I think that it can be used in that regard as well. But again, it just takes some finesse and, and uh, you know, at, the, at that point you don't want to overdo it to flare them. But at the same time, you know, if they're going to finish where you don't want them to and you know, maybe one guy down on the end is going to get a shot, um, I mean, that's great, but it's, you know, not what it could be. So it's really not going to hurt you to give it a little, give it a little movement on the ground and, and see what it does. Yeah, I think, I think you need to make sure that you go over a game plan with your hunting buddies too saying you know if you're looking straight if you're at the end of the say a you or some end of your spread and and birds are are coming like far to your right like you said and they're going to land outside the spread and only one guy's going to shoot you know you'd probably want the guy on the far left if you have say your ends have have the flags you probably want the guy on the far left to start you know mo- doing a little movement to try and pull them back to center so i think it's a great point and um you know, uh, if it's just a random guy that you add to the group, that's a conversation you need to have before the hunt starts. Yeah, that's probably a worthwhile discussion to have. And but I think part of that too will just just comes with experience and trying and seeing what works and what doesn't, and you know, it just kind of becomes a second nature to you know natural progression of okay if the birds are going to finish over here this guy reacts if you know they finish over there the other guy reacts so we've always said you know if you're gonna have a guy flagging in the uh you know you don't want it to be just like the guy that you just hand the flag just because it's his, you know you want him to feel included and he you know doesn't can't call or anything like that like it, you, you need to know what you're doing to some degree when you're flagging so um make sure that whoever's got the flags in their hands kind of have an idea of you know, what, what, what the deal is before, before it gets to the crucial moments. But, um, what else do you think, Dan, what else should we uh, cover here? I'm talking about goose flagging. Um, you know, if uh, you were talking about birds approaching, I think you can, you can use the, the flag to kind of cover, cover yourself. And this even goes into, you know, even the ducks too. And I know specifically you, you know, with the, you do a lot more diver duck action. So, you know, birds coming at you and, and you can still 
use that, but also cover up at the same time. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Clarify that a little bit for me. You can keep you can keep going, you know. You can still be aggressive with it, but just going back to the whole hidden spot, you don't you don't have to give up your location as much, if you know what I mean. You can still you know not pie facing or anything like that. So you're saying you're using it as a concealment piece? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I think the important thing is just to remember natural movements with the flag. I mean, you know, birds. They, they flap quickly, and if you've ever you know seen birds and watched them in fields, they they stretch out, they beat their wings, and then they come back down. Um, you know, that's the type of movements you want to do when you're when you got bird to work, and you don't want to have the overhand just like beating it like a you know badminton racket type of type of swing going on. You want to stay natural. Um, but another thing too is when you've got the birds working your spread. And you you do that finesse movement with the wings, you know, kind of ruffling on the ground. That also can serve as like a an audible type call to birds in the air. So if they're close enough to where that's happening, they can actually physically hear the sound of the flag that imitates the sound of wings beating. And this is similar to like, you know, when you're hunting ducks in flooded timber, you see guys kicking water and making noise. And it's simulating birds, you know, landing in the water and making noise, that kind of thing. Same with like turkey hunters, you know, in the morning you might do a a fly down cackle or something like that. Uh, You know, there's these other types of noises that birds associate with other birds other than just honks and clucks and, you know, yelps and quacks and that kind of stuff. So, you know, the beating of wing pattern, you know, of wings is something that is also you can you can use to your advantage. Um, Doesn't take a lot of movement. Um, just to get that noise going, but it just adds more naturalism and more uh, lifelike activity to your spread. So I think that that's something that a lot of guys probably overlook. Yeah, I th- I think so too. And I still, I would like to get a biologist on just to talk about how sharp of hearing that the Canada geese actually have. Cause you know, when you're even with calling, like if you're doing a, a low, murmur like that's it's not very loud but they hear it and that's a that's a great call in a lot of different situations so you know when you're talking about an audible call with a with a flag just that beating sound you know the the more you scout the more you see birds flapping around and you know they they know that sound so it it would definitely be something that would work well i mean think about it like this um you know as far as they can you know let's say they can hear at least as well as well as a human does or better. Usually a fairly safe assumption. Um, When birds fly over our heads, we can hear their wings. You know what I mean? We can hear the whistling sounds and the, you know, the the air rustling through the feathers. So if we can hear them flying through that high, it's probably a safe bet that they can hear us beating the wings on the ground. Um, Again, that's not the most scientific, uh, scientifically based <laughs> statement I've ever made, but sort of a hunch that I've had, but yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I imagine that they, well, like, you know, even watching the calling videos and stuff like that, the, the murmur, like it is a low, just a, or, 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 you know, and it's a low tone. And, and it's, like I said, they respond really well to it. So even with, I mean, you got to figure they're flying if it's windy at all, Plus the the miles per hour that they're flying has to be their hearing has to be good to hear that. So yeah, without a doubt, they could hear flapping. Yeah, and speaking to their senses, um, you know, when you're dealing with eyesight with geese, and we talked about it a little bit, but you always hear, you know, you flag them on the corners or call on the corners. You know, for anybody that's not sure what that means, it's basically when the birds are working your spread and they're not looking directly at you. So when birds are flying right at you, it's not necessarily the best time to do a lot of a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, it's best when they're when they're kind of flying. If you're, you know, looking at the at a you know uh, a, the face of a clock and you're facing twelve o'clock, you know, when they're on your your two o'clock or your ten o'clock, you know, those kinds of areas where they're circling around you, you're not in their immediate 
eyesight, but you want to, uh, you want to make a little movement to try to catch their peripheral t- peripheral vision to, to, to entice. And really, I mean, even if you can just entice one of the birds in the flock to want to turn a little bit, it could be enough to impact the entire group to get them to turn. So for anybody that's not sure what it means to flag or call in the corners, kind of, that's what we're talking about when, you know, when we cover that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think even uh, we'll go back to, you know, the Trevor Shanahan and, and, you know, when not to call and that was, that was at ducks, but same situation. Like when you don't want to call at them, right. If they swing past you, let them get out a little bit and give them room to be able to swing back around. And that's, you know, kind of the same with, with flagging. I like that. I like that point. Yeah. And I think, um, to build on to that, you know, don't give up on birds when they fly over you. Um, you know, like Sean was saying, you know, there may be days where you have to let birds fly by you and then you can hammer them with a call or a flag or something. And then they come back because they're seeing spread after spread after spread. So if, if you see the flock go by you and then you give up on the flag, they're probably gone. But if you stick with the flag, that might be enough difference that they haven't seen enough of to get at least one bird in that flock to turn and give you another look. As I just said, if you get one, you may get the whole, the whole knot. But, um, you know, I think a lot of guys give up on the, on the flag pretty quickly and pretty easily. So don't be afraid to stick with it. You know, if nothing else, if the birds are by you, the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to keep on flying. But I can guarantee you, if you don't do anything, you just lay there, they're probably going to keep flying anyway. So, you really are not going to lose anything by by giving it a good shot and, and staying on that. Um, what do you think, Dan? Anything else that's sort of uh, key to know about flagging flagging geese? No, well, I'll just go back to that. I, I like that point, and and like I said, you know, we we hunt a lot of areas that usually once they get you know a few hundred yards, they're behind trees, they're difficult to see, but. Um, you know, just like a lot of research I was saying, you know, some of these people, birds are getting half mile away and they're still, still going after it. And this is after, you know, they circle for two or three times and then these birds are, are out of there. They're gone and they keep, they keep at it. They keep with the flagging, they get out of their blinds, make commotion and they're pulling birds back. And like you said, it only takes one. And, you know, if one breaks off and then a couple more and, and they're heading back to take a second look that might be all you need. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of small things that can make big differences when you're talking about waterfowl hunting. And I think a flag it, it can be one of those things. Um, another big thing for me with flagging is I think a lot of guys don't place as much value on the flag because they get motion decoys in the spread or they get, you know, these lifelike decoys that, you know, move around real good when the wind's blowing and that kind of stuff. And and that's great. I mean, that, that no doubt has realist realism to your, your spread, but it doesn't have the same impact on birds as your flag does because it's not going to have that draw effect from the distance. It's not going to give you that audio sound of, um, you know, wings hitting the ground. And, and just like when you watch a group of birds that are standing out in the field and you see the one stretch his wings and starting beating his, you know, beating his wings a little bit. Um, your eyes drawn to that one, you know, that's the same kind of effect that it has with your flag. So if you've got geese working your spread and you've got a normal, normal spread going, and then you beat wings just a little bit on the ground with your flag, that's going to give them something where, you know, that's going to catch their eye. And just like it catches your eye when you're watching a field. So that may be enough to turn them or to finish them up a little better, squared into the hole, that kind of stuff. So don't think that just because you put motion decoys into your spread that you can completely abandon the flag because you certainly, um, you know, you should use it just like Sean talked about as a tool in your toolbox to use to get birds to do whatever you want them, you know, to do whatever you have to, to get them to do whatever you want them to. So don't don't think that just because you throw out, you know, the brand new Avery's with all the motion, you know, stands and all that good stuff that that you're good for motion because you, know, you might be giving up on one really critical element that could help you out and make the difference. Yep, yeah, and most things that are are custom, you know, they they fit a certain situation, and you can customize 
the way that you flag just uh, about anything where, you know, some, some motion decoys, only the wings move and that, you know, some of those mojos, they might be flaring birds. So, you know, you have the vortexes out there and, and whatnot, but I mean, definitely put a flag in the arsenal and I think we're going to be add, adding at least one to ours. Yeah, I, I have a flag. I take it with me every time. I don't use it every time, but um, I usually, I've been taking it. This year I took it with me most times that I hunted. And, um, you know, I've even found that it, it can be effective on ducks as well, especially diver ducks. I mean, you know, if you're using just a black flag that flutters in the wind and stuff like that, that can be lethal on diver ducks. Um, you know, that motion and similar impact to how a mojo works. I mean, it's just that motion that catches their attention from a long ways off and they just zero in on that and, and, you know, they'll come uh, really well to, to that kind of stuff. So if you're a diver duck hunter, um, you know, don't be afraid to look into what a, what a flag can do for your, your diver, your diver hunting and stuff like that as well. So, um, you know, the good thing about the uh, flags, Dan, is they're, they're pretty inexpensive. They're easy to find. They're small, they're portable. You can throw them in a blind bag or throw them in your decoy bags, that kind of stuff. It's not an expensive addition to the the spread, but it can be a really lethal addition to the spread. Do you, off the top of your head, do you know, because I know we talked about it before, you know, it used to be just a black flag and, you know, so you'd be using a black flag and then you'd put it down and say if it was, you know, September and there's green grass and then you just have a black flag laying out there, but now... I know there's a, a couple of flags out there that have different patterns on it for different different seasons. I know one side will be white for if you're in the snow or um I know that there's a couple, you know, snow snow goose flags as well, but um a couple have just the you know, like a max 5 or max 4 on it for field corn cornfield hunting. I'm not sure what what brand it is, but Getting getting better, getting nicer. Yeah, I I tend to use mine um, more, just because I I usually I'm usually calling as well, so uh, I don't use the flag holes on the side of my blind typically. What I'm what I like to do is I I set the flag kind of over my shoulder uh, on the ground, so the handle's up, so it's sort of leaning up against the back of my uh, uh, the my blind my my uh, layout blind. So when I'm calling, I can just reach over my shoulder and just kind of work it with my wrist. And it's just sort of right behind my head. And if I need to, I can lift it up a little bit higher and work them further off. Or if they're down, I can, you know, work it a little bit lower. But it, it's nice because it rests on its almost standing straight up and down. So it looks a little more almost like a silhouette decoy would up against the back of my layout blind versus a flat big V on the ground beside me. But as you mentioned, they make them now with you know, uh, feathers printed on the back. So it looks like a decoy more. I don't really know if a black flag is going to do any harm. I mean, I've seen people killing birds over tires cut in half. So, you know, I, I don't, if they're close enough to have that be an issue, you should probably have your gun off safety and shooting them anyway. Um, but you know, I've found that to be very effective. I think I picked that up off of, uh, watching one of Sean Stahl's videos years ago. And um, I've seen him do that move and it's just, it's just nice because you're sitting in there, you got your hands up by your mouth calling, you just take your one hand off the call, reach up behind you, beat the flag a little bit. It's right there. It's just really easy. makes it, you know, I just found it by doing that. It made it so much easier for me to get to it. I used it a lot more, you know, so it's when it's becomes hard to do in the field is when you don't use it. So whatever you have to do to make it easy to get to, that's the first thing because if it's not easy and it's not convenient, you're not going to do it regardless of what it is. So um, definitely find out how it is. It's going to work for you. And um, you know, if it's passing it to a buddy, or if you're on a solo hunt or whatever it is, just figure out how it's going to work and you know, what's going to be the best, best for you, but definitely give it a shot. I mean, they're, they're inexpensive. It's, it's just one of those things that, you know, I think kind of likes hunting over silhouettes. It takes time to get comfortable doing it and see it work and stick with it and not just, you know, every time, like we, we told Al, you know, with Big Al's uh, silhouette decoys, when we talked to him, every time I've ever hunted over silhouettes, if the first flock of birds that we have come to the spread don't finish, somebody in the group says, oh, the, the, the silhouettes flared them. 
you know, the silhouettes are shining, they're flaring them. It's probably not what it was. If we had a full, a full spread of full bodies out there, no one would have even, you know, mentioned anything like that. So you have a flock come in and you're flagging them and they don't finish. Someone's going to say, ah, flagging doesn't work or flaggings, you know, that, that flared them or whatever it was. So it's, it's overcoming that and just, you know, seeing it work and having that proof for yourself that you, that it's, that it'll finish birds for you. Um, I think some of that's some of the biggest challenges guys face when, you know, you're talking about, you know, getting into goose flagging. Yeah. There's always a, you know, just the, like big Al said, you know, it's just confidence. You have to have confidence in what you're using. And, you know, once you get used to it, you know, I think it's just, like you said, it's another tool. It's something that can, it can help when nothing else is helping. So, um, definitely, definitely something to look into if you, if you already haven't. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed our talk about, uh, goose flagging and offer you some tips and techniques. And if you have a way that you've used flags in the past or you use it in the field, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, reach out to us, let us know. And, uh, we'd love to, you know, maybe pick up some ideas off of you all that, that are using goose flags and any tips that you can offer us to be more successful in the field. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. So, um, definitely reach out to us. If you have any other questions about goose flagging, um, Dan, you got anything else on flagging? I don't think so. All right, let's move on. All right, Dan. So it's that time of the show again. We're coming to the end. And uh, anything else you'd like to to share on this week's episode? Um, first, well, if anyone is down in Louisiana and you've dealt with gators, or even you know Texas has some, or anywhere down there, Florida duck hunting, give us a shout or, or shoot us an email. I want to I want to hear some stories just to confirm my fear i guess but um other than that i guess just my random story of the day i my father-in-law makes fun of my knives at my house because he has some really expensive cutcos or something i believe they're cutcos so i wanted to show him that you know my knives are sharp so i went and i bought a sharpening stone and i've been looking at him for a while now so that's something recently that I've really just gotten into. And tonight I was actually cutting strawberries for my girls for their uh, nighttime snack. And I cut my finger a little bit. So it was almost a, a success story in in a way. So you just sit around sharpening knives so that you can like cut your digit off one, one of these days? <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, I guess. I, mean, it's, I, I don't know what it is, but there's something about having to prove them wrong. So I went and bought a sharpening stone. I started sharpening my knives. And I mean, even down to my my little paring knives for, you know, cutting skin off off apples and stuff. I mean, they're they're pretty deadly at the moment. <laughs> I mean, I have just regular, regular old knives that tend to cut my son's strawberries quite effectively i feel like but hey yeah, man i don't it's it, it it is what it is he has these expensive ones and i think mine are walmart specials or hand-me-downs or something i don't know but right at the moment they are they're they're pretty stellar they're pretty sharp hmm. well i hope for your sake you don't cut any more of your fingers off and um <laughs> You know, hopefully this. Hope I hope for your safety. This this little phase passes quickly because <laughs> the fact that your father in law can bully you into sharpening knives and just I don't know worries, worries me. Well, he you know he takes his to get professionally sharpened and all that, and I, I don't. I'm like you know what I my steak knives cut my steak, my other knives cut whatever I need, but. Just every time he picks them up, there's something that, and I just think he doesn't know how to cut stuff, but uh, maybe that's just me. But anyway, so, I mean, I I took offense to him calling my knives dull and, and crappy, so, you know, I went and bought bought a stone, and, and now I have pretty, pretty razor sharp knives, I guess. Fantastic. Any other random thoughts you'd like to add in this week? You know, I just... They just pop up sometimes. I don't know. 
Yeah. Sometimes. Like every time. <laughs> <laughs> been trying to get a straight answer out of you on some things this week, and it's just been very difficult. So you, <laughs> now I know why. You're just busy sharpening knives and can't answer yeah. me with straight answers. But it's, it's tough to text back when you have a sharpening stone in, in your hand. Yeah, and your fingers are all nicked up and you're lightheaded <laughs> from loss of blood. But anyway... Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and uh, get on with it and, and close out this week's show. This week's parting shot is geared towards this particular time of year. And if you've followed up on any of our past episodes with uh, Pit Boss Waterfowl or uh, Mark Brandon Mule, you'll notice that this time of year you see some of the most fantastic waterfowl photography that you'll see all year long. And it's because you just get a great opportunity this time of year to see birds in full plumage, all kinds of species moving up and down the flyways. They're not getting hunted as much, so they're a lot more relaxed. Water's freezing up. They're congregating in smaller areas for feed and that kind of stuff. So just some great opportunities out there to just witness the beauty and the uh, uh, nostalgia of some of these these fowl that we chase all year long. And um you know, we talk about scouting and we talking about, um, you know, planning your hunts and stuff, but it can be just as gratifying to go out and take a fantastic shot with the camera and, and sharing that, uh, you know, with your friends and your family and just, you know, checking them out and, and, and uh, experiencing that in another way other than just out there trying to kill them. So uh, if you if you get an opportunity and uh, you got some time to kill, go out to the old duck hole and see what's out there now. And uh, I promise you, you'll see some pretty cool stuff this time of year. All right, that does it for episode 28 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We hope you guys enjoyed our discussion on goose flagging and our profile of the King Eider. If you'd like to uh, continue the discussion with us, you can do so on our Facebook page. You can also reach us at info at hpoutdoors.com. And you can check out all of our old episodes that we've recorded um, through iTunes. And if you haven't had the opportunity to do so, please feel free to leave us a rating and review. We would greatly appreciate it. So until next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.